so since uh, there is a question about uh, hdl and ldl so we'll just look at that slide once more and then we'll go to today's class um so yesterday we were discussing about the lipoproteins and their involvement in um, transporting triacylglycerols and cholesterol okay so primarily we looked at these two uh, lipids so so the question is um, let me read the question once more Yeah, I didn't get the concept of HDL and LDL with respect to having high cholesterol levels and possibly having high risk of getting the disease. Okay, so HDL, LDL, and their levels and how that connects to cholesterol levels. So that's what we are going to focus now. So the the first point is we start with these two, chylomicron and VLDL. So chylomicrons transport dietary lipids to uh, other tissues. Okay, primarily to you know it carries in the blood and that activates a lipase, and then the free fatty free fatty acids produced by these lipases are taken by the tissues uh, either for uh, you know beta oxidation, like for example muscles. or for storage by again converting into triacylglycerol in adipose tissues okay and after the cargo delivery the remnants of chylomicrons go back to liver so this is one and second when you have a uh, plenty of carbohydrate available like carbohydrate rich uh, diet so then the main uh, You know, met, uh, dietary material here is carbohydrate. Okay, so they are not carried by chylomicrons. So they are by glucose transporter and so on. So we didn't get into that. But anyway, that excess carbohydrates in liver will be converted into, um, you know, triacylglycerols, and from other sources for example amino acids of transamination the carbon skeleton will be again converted to acetyl coa and used for making uh, triacylglycerols and cholesterol and these are like instead of intestine here liver being the source of the lipid they are packaged in vldl okay the primary differences are the apo lipoproteins that are present and they act as signals which cells are going to take up and what cargo they carry so those are identified by the lipoproteins present in them and vldls again circulate to other tissues via uh, blood okay through these capillaries they again would do the same thing that happened to the dietary lipids and from the vldl when triacylglycerols are removed then the density slightly increases from very low density lipoprotein they become ldl okay so the ldl is essentially rich in cholesterol and that should be taken up and used for storage or for energy production by other tissues extra hepatic tissues okay so their level in the higher level in the blood means higher levels of cholesterol that actually needs to be used and if that is not used then that is what deposits on the blood capillaries blood vessels leading to a disease called atherosclerosis okay so the i think that spelling is coming in the next uh, slide if not i'll write it at that point okay so this is what leads to cholesterol deposits and not just cholesterol even other uh, lipids deposits in our blood walls inside okay the, therefore the lumen gets narrowed or constricted which increases blood pressure because heart has to pump the blood now through a narrower tubes so the pressure increases and if these plaques um size really increases and uh, reduces the capillary further then the blood flow gets obstructed and then you get a cardiac arrest or heart attack okay so that is when the doctors say this artery is blocked and then we are clearing it up they find that by using 
uh, a process called angiogram so that helps them to find where the block is and then they try to remove it up using angioplasty or surgery mostly angioplasty so this is basically a balloon that goes and blows up the uh, up, obstructing material so this is the connection of ldl to the disease okay ldl higher level of ldl indicates higher level of cholesterol in the blood that has no place there it should actually been taken up by the tissues and used up so we will see that uh, there a uh, disease condition we will discuss in today's class so that's the ldl and the difference between ldl and hdl is again apolipoproteins so the hdls actually on the other hand take up any extra cholesterol anywhere and they take it to the liver for metabolism okay hdl level high meaning you have the hdl particles uh plenty so any extra cholesterol can be easily ferried to the liver so high hdl means high availability of vehicle to carry off the any excess cholesterol that may be there ldl means you have excess cholesterol loaded and that is why you have ldl level being high so a healthy person should have less ldl and more hdl and there are conditions in which these levels are affected and that we will discuss in today's class uh dhruv did this answer your question uh yes sir but uh, okay. i had one more doubt yeah go ahead why doesn't the ldl uh, combine with the hdl like all of them why does it not uh, like um incorporated with the hdl so that it gets uh, again uh, retransformed okay. so yeah. these different apo proteins are different functions okay so they are different uh, receptors and then therefore they have different functions so hdl on the surface can combine cholesterol and triacylglycerol transported by specific transporters present on the cell membranes okay and ldls don't do that on the other hand ldls are actually taken up by the cells uh, by the binding of the apolipoprotein on ldl by the ldl receptors on the extra hepatic tissue so th that's uh, going to be a main discussion today so we we'll have a dedicated slide for that so it is basically the specificity and therefore their functional you know delegation so they, they they have different functions to do hdl's job is to pick up cholesterol and transport to liver ldl essentially after the triacylglycerol is taken away from ldl sorry vldl whatever remaining that is primarily cholesterol enriched version is what is ldl and that is to be taken up by the tissues so they do different jobs and that is primarily coming from the different like apolipoproteins Oh, okay. so it's Thank basically you. functional separation okay so today we are going to focus on uh, cholesterol biosynthesis and a little bit discussion on a uh, disease condition and then what are the other molecules synthesized from cholesterol and then we will begin our discussion on hormonal control of uh, metabolism so for those of you who are interested in metabolism related diseases uh you know that is actually an entirely separate course you know it's uh, th there are books uh, diseases of metabolism of the size as big as uh, campbell's biology book okay dedicated only to those because in each one of the pathways you can have uh, defective enzymes and therefore different metabolites accumulate and each metabolite accumulation or the deficiency of the product uh, causes different diseases so we did see some uh, when we were discussing about um, lipids in, in the molecules of life uh, section so today we will see one about ldl you know uh, what are the problems there so before that let us begin on the cholesterol biosynthesis regulation so as you saw yesterday cholesterol biosynthesis is really a complex synthetic process okay so we skipped the last 20 steps simply saying that um, you know methyl group shuffling and um, uh, 
removal uh, removal of methyl groups and shuffling of the double bonds and so on like that we kind of glossed over it but, but whatever we learned itself is complex enough you know formation of mevalonate formation of this uh, ipp and dpp and then they joining together to form squalene and then squalene cyclizing to form the steroid ring so that itself is complex enough so you don't want to do all this synthesis um you know expending lot of nadph and atp uh, unnecessarily so only when cholesterol is required as a precursor or cholesterol is required for new membrane synthesis or uh, do you want to make cholesterol so so cholesterol biosynthesis is regulated uh, at a couple of levels and both of that we will briefly touch upon and this was worked out by the same two people um, whom we discussed yesterday or their work about ldl uptake you know ldl endocytosis uh, we saw uh, you know brown and goldstein so they were the ones who identified these srebps and uh, scap and so on so we'll briefly go through that so these are two proteins in you know, a sterol response regulatory element binding protein srebp okay so this is the main regulatory molecule so it has an integral membrane domain and that is anchored on the endoplasmic reticulum okay so this green line that you see here so its in terminal part which is in you know not on part of the membrane this is what is the regulatory domain and this is in complex with another protein called srebp cleavage activating protein or scap when these two together are anchored on the endoplasmic reticulum they are inactive okay and this scap is the one that senses cholesterol so you know sense cholesterol so it binds cholesterol essentially so when you have um, cholesterol then uh, the when uh, scap is bound with the cholesterol when you have high cholesterol in the cytoplasm then this is going to be bound with cholesterol and that leads to a conformation that keeps them on the endoplasmic reticulum presumably involving another protein that probably retains these two on the endoplasmic reticulum okay but on the other hand if the cholesterol level is low and the scap is unbound with the cholesterol then that releases these two from being on the endoplasmic reticulum and they migrate to golgi okay so on golgi this srebp undergoes two proteolytic cleavages shown by these arrows releasing the n terminal peptide that is what is act, uh, biologically active and this translocates into the nucleus and binds to transcription factors and by directly um, sorry this directly binds to the dna where, where you have these sterol regulatory elements these are dna specific dna sequences or uh, uh, upstream of the coding sequence of the cholesterol biosynthetic enzymes so essentially promoter region of those in uh, genes it binds there and activates transcription of those genes and ultimately um, by translation you are going to have the biosynthetic enzymes that then catalyze the biosynthesis of cholesterol so when you have less cholesterol then cholesterol biosynthesis is promoted by activating transcription of the genes that encode the enzymes involved in cholesterol biosynthesis so this is how they regulate so i told you at the beginning when you have plenty of cholesterol then this shuts off okay scab binds to it and it is retained on the er and as long as they are on er they don't undergo srebp does not undergo uh, proteolytic cleavage and this pathway is very fine controlled because the this cleaved the internal active version in the nucleus is very short lived it continuously gets proteolytically cleaved so only as long as cap is um, you know not bound with cholesterol 
then only you have this n terminal portion available and this n terminal portion should be continuously made this process these two arrows must continuously be happening then only the gene transcription will be going on because this molecule gets constantly degraded okay so that is how this is regulated so this is one mechanism of uh, regulation of cholesterol biosynthesis so the other one is somewhat familiar to us so where you have um, covalent modification by phosphorylation okay so the phosphorylated form is um, inactive and the dephosphorylated form is active just like we saw acetyl coa carboxylase okay for the fatty acid biosynthesis so so the enzyme that is subject to this, such a regulation is hmg coa reductase so yesterday i told you this is the one that catalyzes the committed step in cholesterol biosynthesis uh, in, in general steroid biosynthesis that is the formation of mevalonate okay so this enzyme is uh, dephosphorylated when you have insulin signal so insulin will be high when you have glucose high okay so when you have high level of glucose you want to take up the glucose and convert into storage version that is cholesterol uh, triacylglycerol etc so insulin by stimulating acc carboxylase sorry ac carboxylase acetyl coa carboxylase is going to stimulate free fatty acid biosynthesis and ultimately triacylglycerol in addition by stimulating hmg coa reductase by dephosphorylating this enzyme it stimulates cholesterol biosynthesis as well so essentially glucose is being taken up and the anabolic reactions of these biosynthesis of lipids are stimulated okay on the other hand if glucose is not available then you want to mobilize lipids for energy sources uh, and um, producing the precursors for gluconeogenesis and the ketone bodies uh, in the blood and that is done by blocking the biosynthesis by glucagon okay so the same thing that would um, block the melanyl coa uh, synthetase in free fatty acid synthesis okay so this will via cyclic amp and protein kinase a would end up phosphorylated this enzyme and that inactivates it so this is how uh, phosphorylation dephosphorylation regulates hmg coa and this is integrated to hormone signals again okay and then we know from mevalonate multiple steps you go to cholesterol and cholesterol itself has a feedback kind of regulation one um, it uh, suppresses ldl uptake because ldl is the one that is going to bring cholesterol and when you have a lot of cholesterol already in the cytoplasm you don't want to take more ldl into the cell and therefore the ldl proteins are you know apolipoprotein transcription those gene transcription is um, inhibited by cholesterol okay so that is one role it does and it also stimulates uh, proteolysis uh, you know by an unknown protein or the degradation of hmg coa reductase a third thing cholesterol does is it stimulates this um, acylating uh, enzyme you know this acyl coa acyl transferase uh, which adds uh, to the hydroxyl group of cholesterol it adds the fatty acid acyl moiety making cholesterol ester and that is storing storage form you know this is strongly hydrophobic which is inside the chylomicron that we saw yesterday so these are the ways in which the cholesterol biosynthesis is regulated essentially you balance the synthesis with the dietary uptake when you have plenty of dietary cholesterol available then you don't synthesize you turn it off and instead you take it up and then convert it in convert into cholesterol ester and store it so these are the two important ways in which cholesterol biosynthesis is regulated so now let us see what are the different um, oh, okay so i told you we will discuss a disease so 
in all these discussions you definitely heard me say several times these apolipoproteins and these apolipoproteins being specific they are characteristic for chylomicrons ldl vldl and hdl okay so when you have um deficiencies with them then you can have problems and another thing is yesterday we saw a cartoon probably the last slide uh, where i uh, showed you that this ldl is taken up by endocytosis and for that the apolipoprotein of ldl binds to specific receptors on the cell surface and binding of the ldl to its receptor leads to endocytosis and the ldl gets taken into the cytoplasm in the form of endosomes which fuse to lysosome so now if you have defects in ldl receptor like for example due to a genetic condition like you have a mutation as a result the ldl receptor the protein produced from such a defective gene probably is defective in binding ldl and there is a known such a disease condition genetically inherited disease and that is called familial hypercholesterolemia okay familial means usually refers to runs in the family meaning genetically inherited disease in other words inborn error okay meaning the defect is in the gene and when you have a defect in ldl receptor and where ldl is not taken up by the cells then ldl accumulates in the blood and you have then cholesterol also L, you know in the blood so when uh, when ldl is not taken up then what will happen two things one dietary cholesterol accumulates in the blood in the form of ldl and second because ldl is not coming into the cytoplasm this uh, cartoon here or uh, there is no uh, ldl coming in and therefore the assumption by the cell will be oh we need to make cholesterol there is not enough cholesterol so the cholesterol biosynthesis gets stimulated and then you make cholesterol um in the cytoplasm as well so due to this you have really excess cholesterol and that's why it is called hypercholesterolemia this emia sound usually refers to in blood something you know hypoglycemia meaning glucose level in blood is low anemia you know iron is less in blood ischemia low oxygen in blood so this emia refers to something's level in blood that's what it means so here hypercholesterolemia means cholesterol level being very high in blood that's what this term means and in such a situation what you want to do is you want to intervene therapeutically blocking the enzyme therefore you don't make cholesterol okay and here are those inhibitors so the common inhibitor was originally found in uh, fung uh, fungus and um, so they are the lovastatin and compactin found in fungi um you know and they are uh, used to treat now we have many synthetic versions as well so so the the important point is shown here in the red color here so this part of this molecule okay so when it is r2 it is compacting so the basic structure remains the same and when by when by varying these two r2 groups you have different um you know uh, statins so these are the statins that the cardiologist prescribes to patients having higher cholesterol or higher ldl levels okay uh, and uh, taking statins uh, have been shown to have very little side effects and lot of people having high cholesterol level or uh, take this drug on a daily basis forever and uh, there was a finding that while these drugs reduce the cholesterol level triacylglycerol levels and uh, make your blood biochemistry 
biochemical parameters really look textbook perfect they don't necessarily reduce the uh, plug formation and people didn't know why is that but then now we know the reason is these patients are diagnosed very late okay so their arteries are already uh, loaded with plugged with um, lipids and it's already narrow so now reducing cholesterol biosynthesis only will have a in a marginal effect not a substantial effect so currently the thinking in the field is people prone to such diseases must be taking these statins very early in life like for example um, these are not prescriptions okay i am talking about discussions in the research literature uh, that probably these people should take drugs starting in their mid 20s if they really want to have benefit of um these statins um so you look at the structural similarity here so these these molecules as we learned in our enzyme inhibition they function as competitive inhibitors meaning they compete with the mevalonate okay and uh, so that is how they uh, you block this uh, hmg coa reductase all right so so this is the action of statins so statins essentially block block the biosynthesis of steroids and the condition in which steroid accumulation can happen is when ldl is not internalized due to defective ldl receptor so those are the two main points from this discussion now let us look at uh, what are the other molecules produced from cholesterol i told you cholesterol is an essential molecule okay without cholesterol you would not have even developed into a complete um, uh, you know a newborn child the your essential development itself requires cholesterol embryogenesis itself needs cholesterol so it's an extremely important molecule so its notoriety in modern world is not due to cholesterol being bad it is actually we being bad because our metabolism evolved to store food when it is available the, re, remember the hunter gatherer version of living which happened for 99% of our existence on earth in in terms of evolutionary time uh, we did not have guaranteed three meals sitting on an armchair okay or couch potato sitting on the couch and watching tv and the only exercise being uh, playing with the remote control tv remote control so they were actually running jumping climbing uh, trees uh, and getting low calorie uh, fruits and vegetables and tubers and so on occasionally an animal kill uh, some protein from it they didn't farm uh, lentils and rice and wheat and uh, uh, crystallized sugar and so on so therefore whenever meal was plenty the metabolism learned to store it okay and when when you weren't finding any food or you are crossing a patch of uh, dry land with nothing then it used the stored food and as a result everything was totally fine and uh, there are no issues but you fast forward to 21st century what you are having is three guaranteed meals every day apart from snacks that some people munch uncontrollably you know you can see some people incessantly eat snacks and all of that are calorie people hardly eat non calorie food so they are all being stored in the adipose tissue and on top of it there is no utilization of the stored fat because they hardly get out of the couch and that is why you have all the problems that we have now so the molecules have nothing to do with it okay so if you have a lot of physical work no amount of cholesterol is going to harm you it will all get used up you saw how the regulation works so anyway now we move on to other molecules produced from cholesterol as well as molecules coming from the intermediates of cholesterol biosynthetic pathway so that's what we are going to look at it 
a famous molecule is shown here progesterone so this progesterone is what regulates the uh, estrus cycle uh, in female reproductive system so this is a derivative from uh, cholesterol so we will see in some detail how this is made so cholesterol an intermediate important intermediate pregnant alone this is the one from which the uh, horm steroid hormones are produced and the pregnenolone to progesterone and from progesterone you get in um, adrenal gland in adrenal cortex you have two core hormones uh, glucocorticoids which regulate glucose level and suppresses immune system and that is why excessive use of steroid drugs will end up um, you know having immune suppression problems and this is the reason also why steroid drugs are given to control allergy and inflammation okay so naturally in our system these cortisols do that the glucocorticoid version so the name itself tells you what is uh, this gluco means it senses and regulates glucose metabolism cortico meaning it is produced by adrenal cortex oid refers to steroid okay so it's a steroid produced by adrenal cortex functions in regulating carbohydrate metabolism okay so that's the name uh, uh, th that's what you get from the name and this name and another adrenal um, cortex steroid hormone is this corticosterone version mineralocorticoids so these mineralocorticoids produce one of the important mineralocorticoid is aldosterone what it does is it regulates the uptake of the salts and kidney uh, reabsorption you know uh, uh, in kidney so therefore this hormone regulates electrolyte balance which is again very critical okay so these are important hormones and you need to remember the amount of cholesterol needed to produce these steroid hormones is extremely low because these hormones act at extremely low concentrations so the cholesterol flowing through this pathway is really negligible compared to the cholesterol that goes to membrane or in bile acids and bile salt production and the second set of hormones okay this is the adrenal hormone i am calling these two together as one and the second one are the uh, hormones produced by the gonads okay in um, the first intermediate is testosterone and that is converted in estradiol in ovary and testosterone in males and estradiol in females act as the sexual hormones and these influence the secondary sexual characteristics and also they are also along with progesterone is involved in regulation of female reproductive cycle so so therefore this steroid biosynthesis come from uh, so the steroid hormone biosynthesis uh, are derived from cholesterol as the precursor and how are they produced from cholesterol that we see in the next slide oops oh yeah here um so essentially the side chain is removed and that is removed by an interesting biochemistry okay so two adjacent carbon this 20 and 22 get oxygenated okay by enzymes called mixed function oxidases and these are cytochrome p450 dependent enzymes and i we need not go into the details of these uh, you know electron transfer proteins so you forget about it all you need to remember is mixed function oxidases are involved in oxygenating adjacent carbons okay and you get these two hydroxyl groups and then desmolase the next enzyme ends up cleaving this bond generating a carbonyl group okay so this is the primary reaction um, involved in the formation of all the steroid hormones the side chain cleavage then you have uh, additional steps where 
the other uh, carbon atoms may be oxygenated making hydroxyl groups so where which hydroxyl group depends on which hormone you are making and that detail we need not worry for this introductory class if you remember this that is steroid hormones are formed by side chain cleavage and how the side chain cleavage happens and this point that um, adjacent carbons are oxygenated that is they add an oxygen to make a hydroxyl group by a class of enzymes called a mixed function oxidases and such enzymes are involved in later uh, oxygenation steps as well in the pregnenolone uh, precursor for the other hormones okay so this is uh, starting from cholesterol now i told you the intermediates in the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway also serve as precursors to make other molecules and that is in this slide okay this whole lot of molecules are made depending on what kind of organism you are like for example this isopentenyl pyrophosphate this is the active isoprene group i told you right in the yesterday and from that molecule you make all of this let us um, start somewhere familiar we'll start here so the isoprene isoprene themselves are active molecules this quinones that we saw ubiquinone and in plants plastoquinone and these are electron carrier proteins they are synthesized from this dolichols we saw that they carry um uh, carbohydrates for making uh, lipopolysaccharides on the um, membrane so the they anchor on the membrane help in transfer of groups from one molecule to the other on the membranes so so we saw that and uh, phytol chain in chlorophyll so we saw phytol in chlorophyll so there um that biosynthesis all long chains where you have isoprene uh, the the 2 methyl butadiene portion so that is this portion um is repetitively involved in biosynthesis of those rubber and cholesterol itself then we learned from cholesterol steroids bile acids and vitamin d so this we have already learned then vitamin a that again has a long chain vitamin e related to dolichols you know that it's an antioxidant on the membrane vitamin k involved in blood clotting carotenoids we saw you know uh, the accessory pigments in um, chloroplasts in the light harvesting ant and all then these we haven't heard of abscisic acid and gypperlic acid these are plant growth hormones so abscisic acid is involved in leaf senescence and falling you know in the uh seasons where leaf fall happens and fruits ripening and falling and for the separation of that part leaf or the fruit that is promoted by abscisic acid gibberellic acid is involved in germination of seeds so so many molecules are produced from this isopentenyl pyrophosphate and they all together called isoprenoids and isoprenoid biosynthesis okay so these are the variety of molecules that are produced from the isoprene uh, that is produced as part of cholesterol biosynthesis and many fragrances as i told you are derived from this okay so the last point in our metabolism discussion is this um, covalent modification of proteins uh, we revisit so we are very familiar with phosphorylation and dephosphorylation as a covalent modification you have also seen here and there amp being uh, attached to an enzyme and that becomes an active or you have also seen uh, what else you have seen on the way i am trying to recollect primarily phosphorylation dephosphorylation and uh, we have seen this udp cdp attachments in activating but i didn't discuss the term in detail so anyway for sure you remember the phosphorylation dephosphorylation being a regulatory covalent modification to enzymes similarly there are other groups that can be added one of them is 
uh, isoprene group addition okay to proteins covalent attachment and that is called prenylation and this can be sometimes a foreign cell group attachment so that is called prenylation as well um, if you want to be very specific foreign cellation and sometimes it is geranyl geranyl group attachment so you know geranyl is ipp dpp joining is geranyl group and then you have a, another ipp that became foreign cell but instead if you have two geranyl group joining that gives you this 20 carbon geranyl geranyl group so these are hydrophobic molecules okay so they help in anchoring some of the proteins to cell membranes and that often is important for regulating their biological activity so the membrane bound form will have an activity or sometimes it is sequestered on the membrane and taken away from activity and those sort of regulation is done by covalent addition of these prenyl groups so that is prenylation. So now you will not be able to think cholesterol in a bad way, okay? After hearing all of this. 